Hi, you're listening to Stefan Levera Podcast, a show about Bitcoin and Austrian economics brought to you by swan.com. Today, we're talking about hodling through the cycles. Do you find it hard to hodl? Potentially, now at this time, there's a lot of people who are feeling very bearish. Well, American HODL rejoins me to talk about HODLer psychology, Bitcoin culture, areas of overconfidence, as well as a bit of a discussion about mainstream culture, as well as thoughts about different jurisdictions and thoughts on the next cycle. Here's my chat with American HODL. Mr. American HODL. I mean, if that even is your real name after all. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. <laughs> yeah, there was like the uh, that thing with... Uh... Well, we won't say who, because in my opinion, that that was a bit of a light docs, you know, so out of, you know, in our in our culture, in Bitcoin culture, light doxing, not cool, not cool, even if the person self doxes, right? Right, right. Yeah. I mean, in this yeah. case, it sounds like it's been public since that time. But anyway, whatever. Um, it has. It has. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the vibe has been a little bit down recently, hasn't it? And I think obviously <laughs> that's, part that's of that an is... Understatement. That's a huge understatement. Yeah. <laughs> and my guess on that, and I, I'm curious to hear what you think. You know how people that people make that saying, the opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you look at, as an example, some of the conferences last year, even in a bear cycle, were more populated or more attended than some of the conferences even this year. So I'm wondering if it's like that. Are we kind of in this indifference zone? It's a bit of an accumulation phase. It's equivalent to, you know, 2015 or maybe 2019. Um, something like that. What do you reckon? Yeah, you know, to me, this cycle, I don't know how you feel. I'd love to get your take too. But like, to me, this cycle feels a lot more like 2015 than it does 2019. And in 20, 2015 was when I effectively entered the market. I entered late 2014, but it was like Christmas time 2014. So really, I'm class of 2015. And um, all throughout 2015, you know, I was like, a, I was a newbie then. So I would, I would come in with a chipper attitude, very optimistic, young, eager to take on the world stuff. And, and I'd be like, hey, tell me about Bitcoins, guys. And people on the forums would be like, fuck you. Shut the fuck, <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, everybody was just in such a bad mood, so depressed. There was like almost no news coverage of Bitcoin in 2015. Now, things are things are different now. I mean, there's a ticker on CNBC every day. Bitcoin is in the, you know, the permanent like cultural zeitgeist. Bitcoin is a is a presidential campaign issue. But I think that same feeling of just like sort of general malaise is there. And I think if I'm to diagnose it or pinpoint it, it's because we as Bitcoiners, and I'm as guilty as anybody, got into this sort of malaise of inevitability where we just assume that like um, some of these sacred cows, like, you know, higher lows, right? Like we're, we're just, you know, immutable laws of the universe and they're not. And Bitcoin is still a wild and volatile beast uh, and it's unpredictable as hell. And, you know, if you get too married to any sort of outcome in Bitcoin, especially like a price outcome, um, you're going to have a bad time and you're going to suffer from like some form of Bitcoin derangement syndrome. And I, I certainly like we've lost friends over the years who've been, you know, guilty of that. And uh, we've had to fight off these feelings inside ourselves. And hodling is not an easy journey. It's I've said this like numerous times, but it's one of the simplest things in the world. When you tell the story in 30 years, people are going to think that uh, you were just some lucky son of a bitch who just, you know, showed up at the right time, right? And it's like, oh, yeah, what'd you do? You just bought Bitcoins and then you you hodled them. Uh, it sounds like the easiest thing you could possibly do in the world. And it's not until you get in the, you know, the inside of the maelstrom that you realize, like, this thing is one of the most difficult experiences in investing and, and not just in investing, but just, you know, um, I think it's one of the most difficult experiences you can have as a human being right now. Uh, psychologically, maybe not physically, but psychologically. And yeah, it's very simple, but it's not easy. And like, you know, we're all going to have to, <laughs> we're all going to have to let go of some of our more religious beliefs around price models, definitely around right. price models, you know, maybe yeah, not around so, the culture and the principles, but around the, around the price, certainly, you know. Yeah, for sure. And for a long time, people had this idea of, oh, It'll go up, but then it'll crash, but the, the crash won't be high. You know, it'll be better than last time kind of thing. This, you know, like you were saying, the higher lows idea, yeah. or even this idea that if you bought and held for four years, you know, you would always be up. Where I think recently that was kind of broken, depending on, you know, if you cherry pick the exact top of December 2017, and there was a point where recently, you know, maybe last year it was down at 15,000. So, okay, yeah, you were down theoretically. If you were stacking yeah. over that period, you were up, but if you had just done like a point in time, you know, at the peak of 2017, uh, okay, yeah, you were down for a little bit. 
Um, but you're right. I think there's a little bit of a complacency in that. Um, but at the same time, Bitcoin is here to stay, right? And I think that yeah. for me as a 2013er, and I agree with you, a lot of what you were saying, for me as an early 2013 Bitcoiner, sort of riding you know, through the 80% drops all the way, there was not this sense of, oh, Bitcoin is coming back, you know, in 2014 and 15. It, was, it just wasn't there. So the 2018, 19 bear cycle, it, it was, that was like a walk in the park. It sort of felt like there was just so much going on and all this development and, you know, Bitcoin is coming back for sure. So it just felt so much easier uh, than the 14, 15 cycle where a lot of people kind of, you know, they left, you know, Bitcoin Twitter or kind of online. Um, I mean, Bitcoin Twitter wasn't as much of a thing, um, but yeah, yeah it, I, it just changed. I think in, I think in 18, 19, 20, what happened was um, many of us got overly confident. We were also, you know, as, as sort of a, let's just call it what it is. It was sort of a fear reaction. We were having sort of a fear reaction um, that caused us to suddenly our entire lives became Bitcoin. And it was like nobody was touching grass. It, it was just, you know, you were listening to every single Bitcoin podcast that came out. You were on Twitter eight hours a day. Maybe this is just me, but I feel like this was actually a lot of people were doing this. And we were all upping our conviction. And then, you know, there was this sort of game on Twitter of like, I'm more convicted than you. No, I'm more convicted. Than we're all the most convicted maximalists that could ever be, right? And it was around the time Safety's book came out. And I think we realized like the historical importance of Bitcoin, not just in a, you know, the last 50 years context, but the last 5,000 years context. And then we started to feel the sense of, you know, just, I don't know, destiny about this whole thing that, you know, certainly, obviously, we, we have the secrets to the universe. And I, I think what happened is reality smacked us in the face, which is what happens when you get overconfident. And if you look at the cycle sort of, you know, through the years, I've, I've, I wasn't around for 13, but I've gone back and looked at um, a lot of the things that were written around that time. So in 13, people were wildly overconfident. I mean, just so overconfident. Um, if you read the VC takes from that era, people were saying that Bitcoin was going to $50,000. In 13, they were saying that, right? And Bitcoin wasn't even anywhere close to fifty thousand dollars. It was a, uh, I think like twelve hundred was the peak. Yeah. And then when you, whenever you have this overconfidence cycle, you get this cycle that comes behind it of just the hangover from the overconfidence, you know, and it's like this sort of depression. And then in seventeen, you had sort of a more more of a cautious optimism about what was going to happen. And I remember myself. I don't know how you felt at the time, but. In sort of early uh, 17, like late 16, early 17, I was telling people that Bitcoin was going to go to $2,700. I was like, yeah. And I and I thought I was being wildly bullish, right? I was like, end of the year, $2,700. We're going there, baby, right? And then Bitcoin went to $20,000 because the market likes to climb a wall of worry. And so I think there's something to this, you know – cautious optimism that produces better bull markets. I'm not sure like what the psychological phenomenon is at play, but this is just something that I've noticed over time. So if that is true, just a little injection of hopium, that means that, you know, the cautious optimism we're all feeling after having just been overconfident is potentially setting us up for a better cycle, right? Because I think this last cycle was a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> you know, just, it wasn't as good as it should have been. And there are many reasons uh, for why that was the case. But, the you know, we have to look inward and say that one of the primary reasons is we were all overconfident. We were thinking of Bitcoin as being inevitable and, you know, the, the price was just going to stair step its way to heaven. And that's just not how reality works. Look at the – go back and look at the Weimar chart, right? That Weimar chart is chaos. And now imagine I've, – I've done this where I've looked at the chart, the peaks and the valleys, and I've imagined myself living through that time period and – you know, if you're being honest with yourself, it would have been really hard to make it to the end, especially if you were one of the people who saw it early, right? So, you know, yourself being a 2013 Bitcoin or Bitcoiners who are in even earlier than you is like over time, you know, you basically, you get weary, you get worn down by the market. The, the emotional volatility is so much. And so you have to do something in order to cope with that so that you can make it to the end. Otherwise, you're going to be one of the guys who coughs up his coins at the exact wrong part of the cycle. Like, you know, I, I knew OGs who were in for seven, eight years, and then they were selling at uh, 16K Bitcoin because they were – the fear just enveloped them. It overwhelmed them. And you just want to do anything you can in your power to prevent yourself from being that person. And it takes a lot of emotional control and self-discipline and, you know, having a having a support network like – 
also all the sort of regular advice like get enough get enough sleep go to the gym you know eat right it's like very grandma advice uh but that's what you got to do to survive this market because it's psychologically torturous and it's it's okay to admit that you know yeah i I think you're you make a lot of good points there around overconfidence i think i definitely tried to say no there's not going to be a super cycle right like i was one of those people saying no i don't think it's going to be a super cycle like be ready it could be an 80 percent drop but i just don't know where the top or bottom is you know um but at the same time it it just psychologically hits you and i think what happens is if people are in this mindset where they're just like i'm not going to work or i'm going to retire at this particular time you know or if you don't have if you no longer have fiat income that can make make it just another level of tricky, you know, another level of difficulty for you because now you're thinking about managing the finances and sort of, okay, how much fiat do I need? How much runway do I actually need? Um, because, okay, let's say you're a committed Bitcoiner and you believe that there'll be future bull cycles to come, you still need to kind of ride out the bear cycles. And so the question then is like, how do you do that as long as you know, if you're not working now, of course, I think the best plan is to continue working. Um, but you know, there's a bunch of Bitcoiners who aren't. So you know, that's kind of like how do you manage, how do you manage the financial aspect of it and not get wrecked yeah. on that. So the the two methods that I've seen OGs uh, try and do, like just to speak to that, you know, specifically and directly, is um, if you are in a position where you're retired off Bitcoin and you don't have any fiat income coming in, there are basically two things you can do. You can try and Take enough off at the top to make it through five years, six years, whatever it may be. Um, you know, and whatever your burn rate is for your family, you try and stay within that. Or the other thing you do is you don't take anything off the top and then, you know, you just piece off a little uh, along the way. So, like, you, you take off a little Bitcoin each month for expenses. Um, and I think both of those are, like, fine strategies that will get people through. And I think both of those are good things to do. Now, the worst thing you can possibly do, which is what I've seen a lot of people actually do, right, is they say to themselves, I'll just take off a little as needed. Then the bottom hits. They get panicky, fearful. And they end up locking in, you know, a loss or or a, a lesser gain, right? The, you know, if you've been hodling for a long time. You, you lock it in and then it becomes real. Cause a paper loss is just a paper loss. It, it doesn't mean anything, right? Um, you know, if you look at, if you're a seasoned hodler and you were with us for March of 2020, I mean, Jesus, go back and look at, um, the swing in your position from March 12th, 2020 to March 12th, 2021. It's a crazy swing. I promise you. And yeah, the volatility is intense. I mean, a year ago, Stefan, it was like, um, every influencer I could think of and many who I greatly respect were on Bitcoin uh, Twitter saying that, you know, all of the GBTC Bitcoin was fake, right? And this this was like the big chief FUD item at the very end of the cycle. And they were like, it's going to take us all down. There's 600,000 Bitcoins unaccounted for, right? And uh, that was just, you know, that was peak fear and everybody was really feeling it. And there had been a lot of shenanigans with like the FTX and Luna and I think one of the things we found out is that the, uh, you know, all, almost all of the yield started as an ARB play on GBTC and then became a derivative at some point. And then, you know, it was a derivative of a derivative of a derivative of the ARB on GBTC. And that was what was funneling. Um, that was, that was how all of the money in DeFi was being made for a time period until, you know, inevitably that house of cards, you want to talk about inevitability, the daisy chaining of the DeFi ecosystem and the collapse of the DeFi ecosystem was always <laughs> inevitable. The people who were shocked by that, it was like, come on, man. I, I felt the same way as um, when the when when we're like crying in our Cheerios and the TradFi guys look at us and they go, hey, come on, you idiots. You invested all your money in, 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 in Internet uh, coins. What do you think was going to happen? Right. Like I, that's how I felt about <laughs> the DeFi degens. So, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of fear at that time. But just think to yourself, I remember having this thought like a year a year later, it feels like ancient history. But even at the time, I thought to myself, you know, hey, in uh, what, just two or three months, the clock is going to strike midnight. The ball is going to drop in New York and it'll be a new year. And this memory is going to be just etch a sketched from everyone's mind and we'll just be onward and upward. And that is essentially exactly what happened. I mean, the Bitcoin price basically recovered uh, to, you know, 25 to 30K only a few months later. And all of the fear that was, you know, at the bottom of the market uh, that was enveloping people sort of just dissipated or it, or it lingered, it hung in the air, but it didn't really have the teeth that it once had. So 
my advice to people who are, you know, on their hodling journey is when things are their most scary, try not to listen, try to go slow, take things day by day. And conversely, when you are feeling the most greed you've ever felt in your life and you think you're the smartest person that ever lived and you're so rich and how could life get better? I mean, you're just – you're a genius and everybody else is a fucking peasant. <laughs> like, you're right. <laughs> um, also go slow and take it day by day and maybe don't buy yourself the multi-million dollar home or, you know, the Rolex or the Ferrari or whatever, right? Just take it slow and just realize like, hey, whether it's – a really bad time in the Bitcoin market or a really good time in the Bitcoin market, like this too shall pass. This is not going to be here forever. This is temporary. Um, in Bitcoin especially, you know, the bull markets are very short and infrequent. Most of our time spent hodling is in times like this and in, in this kind of market. This kind of market is like the majority of, of the Bitcoin time uh, where, you know, things are just co- sort of chopping sideways. I mean, we lose perspective over the years, Stefan, because – Man, if me and you had had a conversation in whatever, 2018, and I was telling you, dude, we're going to be at 27K and everybody's going to be so angry and upset, we would just laugh and laugh and think that was the best thing ever. And then we would push all our chips into the table and buy even more Bitcoin, right? But now when you're here living it, it feels terrible. (laughs) It feels so bad. Yeah, and, and I, one thing yeah. I'll add to that is people anchor to let's say 20k from 2017. Yeah, but the reality here's the reality: 75 percent of that year was spent under 5k. Right. 90 percent of that year was spent under 10k. It was only that last month or so that it was like you know maybe one one or two months that we were getting up above 10k and around 20k. But and yet it's, people anchor yeah. back to 20k. And so this is as our friend Pierre Richard says: hyper Bitcoinization is real, right? Like right now, where as we speak today, we're recording this 18th September 2023. The price is around 27, 26k, whatever. And yeah. like you said, just in March of 2020, it was 3k. So there's kind of you know it's yep. it's a lot of cherry picking. Right. And people, you can always kind of pick the dates. And let's say a Bitcoin hater or a skeptic can always pick their own dates and say, oh, look, see, blah, 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 you're down. Um, but, you know, I think, I think it's fair to say that if you are saving for the long term, you've done okay. Most people have done okay. Well, everyone who's done, you know, who's been stacking for five years plus has done okay, you know. Um, but there are oh, times totally. where you feel like an idiot, you know, like we feel like idiots at times in the cycle. I think it's okay to admit that. I think that a lot of people are, you know, they're they're in their Bitcoin Zen. They say they're in their Bitcoin Zen. And uh, I never believe them because I know it's not true. Um, I know that they're in their house or their apartment just being like, fuck, 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 right? Like that's, I mean, that's the feeling that I'm having. So I'm assuming that many other people are feeling that way also. Um, but, you know, it's, your feelings are not that important in investing. You don't really need to listen to them. You know, every, every human being has... Um, activity bias, right? And activity bias is basically that, you know, it's better to do something rather than nothing. And and this is what our evolutionary biology has taught us because when you are facing predators, you know, you're a small mammal facing predators on the grasslands of wherever, and you, you know, you see something move in the grass. Well, nine times out of 10, it's going to be the wind, but one time out of 10, it's going to be a jaguar that fucking kills you. So it's better to run away every single time and be scared of the grass than it is to face the one time where the jaguar kills you, right? Now, in investing, if you, you know, run away every time you see the wind move, you're basically just locking in losses and you're going to your performance is going to be abysmal, right? The people that are perform that perform best in markets are people who are literally dead uh, or people who act like they're dead or people who don't have access to their money. Like how many of the Mt. Gox creditors do you think would have been would have done as well had they not been a Mt. Gox creditor? Right. Like they still haven't received any of that money, but at some point they're going to. And <laughs> it was basically a forced hodl. Like the Japanese court system forced them into hodling it. And yeah, they're going to receive pennies on the dollar. But guess what? They're still going to do better than they would have done if they were allowed to control their own money. Gotcha. And, yeah. uh, and it's fair to say many of them have now sold off their claims. So it's kind of those coins have kind of transferred to stronger hands, let's say, or kind absolutely. Of, uh, people now who might have bought a claim from a Mt. Gox claimant and now they're you know going to be probably one, huddling. One thing that's interesting is that um, people have done polls on the forums for the Mt. Gox claimants and over the, the course of their forced hodl, 
many of them were, you know, they came in as degen. Some of them were drug users on the Silk Road. I mean, who knows why? There were a lot of reasons people were here in 2013, and not all of it was for sound money economics. Like, not everybody on uh, the Silk Road was reading Hayek, you know. It's like, that's just not how <laughs> things work. So, you know, they came in for whatever reason, and over the years, because they've been forced into this hodling position, they've learned a lot about Bitcoin. And uh, some of the polls on some of the forums uh, internally for the Mt. Gox creditors show that um, they're planning to dump their Bcash when they receive it, but they're going to hold their they're going to continue to hold their Bitcoin. So sometimes this is a FUD item that comes out, you know, during bear cycles or bull cycles where it goes, you know, oh, all the Mt. Gox coins are going to get unlocked and these people are going to dump it. It's like, no, they these people learned during the course of their time uh, hodling, forced hodling, that Bitcoin is going up in value and they want to hang on to it because it's an important and pristine asset, right? I, I think the most important meme... To, to study, it should be documented in, in uh, whatever Bitcoin museum ends up being built one day, is the meme of the guy looking at the computer screen and he's elated when Bitcoin goes to a 1,000. And then the last panel is he's got a shotgun in his mouth when it goes to a 100,000, it crashes to 100,000. <laughs> that is human psychology first and foremost. And I feel like every Bitcoiner like highly relates to that feeling uh, that that little cartoon character <laughs> Is, is having so like study that meme and don't be the guy with the shotgun in your mouth at 100 100k bitcoin you know <laughs> yeah um and you know looking more broadly at what's going on around the world obviously there's a lot of talk now about are we in a recession right like kind of macro right you know what's going on around the world are we going to see higher unemployment are we going to see like is commercial real real estate going under like there's kind of a lot of talk about this kind of thing i mean my sense of it is we pr well i think parts of the like i think a lot of america is really struggling uh but it seems that the powers that be are a little bit aloof or out of touch with that obviously so you've seen uh paul krugman's uh talk about how inflation has been defeated and so on uh, I'm curious if you have any views on this kind of idea that, you know, is it that, you know, certain sectors of the U.S. economy are doing great guns and then other parts, you know, big parts of the American economy are really struggling? Where are you at there? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, um, rich people are not struggling, right? It's it's people who are living on debt who are struggling. It's, um, you know, in America, we basically have this in this middle class that is effectively poor, but uh, they have access to debt. So they're able to do this sort of theatrical impression of not being poor, right? I mean, when yeah. you make um, $50,000 a year, but you have a $50,000 truck in the driveway, that doesn't make a whole hell of a lot of sense, right? And you also have a mortgage payment and, you know, you got, you know, just daily living expenses and, like, a lot of these people are, are deeply struggling, right? But, you know, when you're rich and you go to the grocery store, it doesn't matter to you what eggs cost because you didn't know what the fuck eggs cost before, right? So, like, if eggs cost $5 or $6, uh, it, it doesn't matter to you because it's all the same. It's it's relative, right? Because your fiat net worth is going up so much every time they print or every time they inject liquidity into the economy. I think that a lot of uh, global finance depends on the outcome of the American election in 24. And if the Republicans, uh, you know, take the executive branch, then I think we're likely to see – the replacement of Jerome Powell and the reversal uh, of a lot of his tightening at some point, uh, and also injections of liquidity. I mean, Trump, Trump particularly seems to be the front runner, and he has stated numerous times that you know he's a fan of negative rates, he's a fan of helicopter money, he's a fan of you know artificial stimulus, like he's a fan of all those things. And one thing we know is that those things pump Bitcoin, right? And so you know it's very macro. <laughs> Listen, we all learned a lot about macro, Stefan, over the last few years, and. You know what I basically learned about macro is that uh, it, it, it's it's divination. I mean, it's like it's like you know, it's technical analysis. But the guys who do it have access to a thesaurus and they can use words you don't understand. And it's like they're casting a spell <laughs> on you. No one knows what the fuck they're talking about. I've seen you know ninety nine point nine percent of these macro influencers be wrong consistently. So. Your guess is as good as mine, is as good as, you know, Luke Groman's, is as good as anybody's. Like, it doesn't, right? Like, nobody knows what's going on. It's it's just much too complex of a system, and it has too many interventionist policies to really get a, get a handle on it. Whereas, when you contrast this to the Bitcoin system with its programmatic monetary policy, well, we don't know what the fiat price is going to be because this is an important, I think, mental model for people to get their heads around is the volatility doesn't come from Bitcoin. Bitcoin is 
one of the most stable things in the world. It's it's this metronome of precision that is just constantly producing blocks every, roughly every 10 minutes. And, you know, Bitcoin uh, does what it's going to do no, no matter what is happening in the outside world. Whereas fiat is full, you know, subject to the whims of, of uh, political elections. It's subject to the whims of regulators. It's subject to the whims of the personal um, legacy of the Fed chairman, like how Jerome Powell wants history to view him. It's subject to all of these many human foibles. And, you know, the thing that we did in Bitcoin was to create a fair rules-based system and say, hey, I'm not, a, I'm not allowed to change the rules. You're not allowed to change the rules. It doesn't matter if you have, you know, one Satoshi on the Lightning Network that's held in the custodial wallet or if you're Michael Saylor and you have 100 and, you know, whatever, 50,000 Bitcoin. It doesn't matter. We're, we're all subject to the same rule set and we choose voluntarily to abide by this rule set. It doesn't work that way in fiat world. And that's where the volatility comes from is all of these messy decisions and, you know, these messy human actors in the economy. And it's just it's, impo- you know, you know, from being an Austrian, it's impossible to forecast. So it's like um, I could give you my best bullshit advice about what's going to happen macro. But I don't know if there's going to be a recession and, and nobody else does. You know, you got to just uh, if you're a Bitcoiner, the best advice is just to keep stacking, to continue working your job, to make sure that your all areas of your life are defensible. You know what I mean? I mean, if uh, you have your own business, even better, um, you know, stack up on what you need. And, you know, inflation is starting to hit in America, right? And it's changing some of the consumer uh, spending and saving patterns, which I think is interesting. And, you know, we as Bitcoiners, we predicted inflation accurately long before everybody else predicted it. In fact, we were predicting it basically since 2010. I mean, since they printed, we've been predicting inflation and it finally showed up when they uh, overprinted on the fiscal side rather than the the monetary side in 2020. And now we have consistent high consumer price inflation and it's not coming down anytime soon. It's going to take quite a bit to get it down. And, you know, it's basically here to stay. And I hope over time that drives people to towards scarce assets. You know, so far, I think many people are looking for, you know, safety in all the wrong places. Like we see, um, you know, the, the high end watch market is going up the, you know, the comic book market, vintage cars, right? Like people just, they don't know about Bitcoin still. And it's still, you know, we say this, it's like, it's trite, um, amongst Bitcoiners, but we are still very early in understanding. We're not, we're not early in sort of, um, brand recognition. Bitcoin has tremendous brand recognition, but how many people actually know for instance, that there are even 21 million Bitcoins. Of the people who've heard of Bitcoin, uh, I would hazard to say that less than 10% of those people are even aware that there are 21 million. Most people just don't know. Yeah, I think that's right. It's... It takes time for people to make that change. And uh, for a lot of them, they're stuck in the mindset of, oh, I need to save in property or, oh, like you said, random things like watches and whatever, used cars and whatever things that are out there. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about culture and what you think will change you know, from a culture perspective. Now, of course, we're still living in a very degenerate culture. Um, but I think we as Bitcoiners, many of us have a view about where we think things are going culturally like do you believe that you know people will start focusing more on family and long term and therefore that will change how they look at things like the current system of family or schooling or you know how we interact in our mm-hmm. society i'm curious if you have any you know any thoughts you've been uh, you know thinking yeah, about there i i think the interesting thing is that uh you know the mainstream sort of celebrity culture mainstream news culture mainstream television culture is just not, it's not providing people any health, wealth, or happiness. And I think that, you know, basically we've, we've lost religion largely, and there's a movement back towards religion, especially, you know, Christianity and uh, Islam seem to be ascendant at the moment, especially among, amongst younger people. Um, Because they're, it's, and I think it's wise because, you know, one thing we know about human beings is that human beings seem to have a religious module in our brains where we're all religious about something. Certainly many of us are religious about Bitcoin and other people are religious about in general things that make them healthy, wealthy or happy. So it's like, you know, every, I look around and just everything's a religion now, Stefan, you know, the Joe Rogan podcast is a religion and CrossFit's a religion and the Marvel movies are a religion and veganism is a religion and keto is a religion and Bitcoin's a religion and shitcoins are a religion. And it's like, 
I, you know, everywhere you look, people are looking for things that are going to make their lives better. And if you look at, you know, the mainstream discourse and mainstream culture, I think that it doesn't have the answers that people are looking for anymore. Everybody has a sort of sense of institutional betrayal where, you know, they trusted an institution and because they trusted that institution, whatever it was, they were, they were harmed by it in some way, shape or form. And people are starting to come together and form communities over a shared sense of institutional betrayal. Now, here's the, the hard thing is that the institutions still have a tremendous amount of power, like real, just raw, hard power. And, you know, we're going to kind of move into this world in America, I think especially, and, you know, it's already happening in Europe pretty pretty heavily. It's happening here too, but of just, you know, sort of a narco tyranny where the state is powerless to help you or make your life better, but it's not powerless to harm you and make your life worse, right? Um, and so we're starting to slide into that sort of uh, society and people are, you know, rightly looking for a return to what I would call, you know, postmodern or, or sorry, pre-modern or traditional values. And what do those traditional values consist of? It's like community, family, um, purpose, meaning. You know, there's a big meaning crisis in the world where people go, you know, what what is the point of it all? And it's like, well, listen, like modernity and capital, you know, modern capitalism told you to like, you know, have it your way. It's all about you, man. Focus on yourself. And it's like the truth is the best parts of life are living for other people and, you know, trying to gratify yourself is, is really not that not that meaningful or, or interesting and is certainly not substantive. So I think people are looking for gratification in more of the traditional sense, in a communal sense. And what's interesting is they're finding a lot of these communities online. Um, I, was talk, I was talking to my wife the other day and she goes, you know, you Bitcoiners are basically like Amish people who live <laughs> exclusively on the Internet. And I was like, that's <laughs> That's strangely true. That's true about us, I think, you know. It's like we do have a lot of Amish values. If you go to the, <laughs> you go to the Bitcoiners, they're talking about uh raw milk and being close to nature and being, you know, not um not taking in, you know, modern chemical. <laughs> I mean, there's all sorts of things that are like very Amish in, na- <laughs> in nature, which is sort of hilarious, you know. Right. Back to the show in a moment. The lead sponsor of this show is Swan.com, and Swan is putting on Pacific Bitcoin Festival. This is more than just a conference, and I think this is a great event for you to attend to help you hodl through the cycles. Certainly, at different times in the cycle, you can feel up or down, but at Pacific Bitcoin Festival, we'll be celebrating the incredible world of Bitcoin, the ultimate lifestyle. It's a thriving community working together to forge an awe-inspiring, bright, orange future. Swan has pulled together an incredible lineup of top-notch speakers including feature speakers like Max Kaiser, Stacey Herbert, VJ Boyapati, Alex Gladstein, Lynn Alden, Jimmy Song, and so many more. There will be a main stage for dedicated talks, panels, and fireside chats that you know and love, and also the very popular Swan Dome with deep dive sessions, as well as all kinds of activities and side events all happening all at this time over the week, October 5th and 6th, in LA at the Barker Hangar. So I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Make sure you bring along some friends and family so they can learn about Bitcoin. Get your tickets at pacificbitcoin.com and get a discount using code LAVERA. And of course, when it comes to hodling through the cycles, you need hardware. Coinkite.com can help you get the ultra secure cold card. The cold card is a phenomenal device. It's really secure. You have multiple secure elements there, you can be more confident in the fact that your cold card does not actually have to phone home in order to work. So that's a cruel feature that you can use. You don't even have to directly plug it into your computer. So it's a great tool to use to take your coins off the exchange, get them off any custodian services and hold them yourself with the cold card you can use it in a range of configurations so don't be afraid if you're a beginner you can just buy the cold card the mark IV, and get a USB-C cable plug it directly into your computer and use it easily with software like sparrow wallet spectre desktop or electrum now of course if you're a more advanced user or intermediate user you can use it with the micro SD card and plug it into the wall instead of into your computer and of course there are all kinds of advanced features like if you want to use a passphrase if you want to use use seed XOR or if you of course want to use multi-signature there's all kinds of options there available for you so go to coinkite.com pick up your cold cards either for yourself or your friends and family and get a discount using code lavera and now back to the show yeah and maybe having having big families maybe that's sort of encouraged in our in our world maybe not everybody but it seems you know it's funny because the 
from the outside looking in, they might look and say, oh, you Bitcoiners, you're all a bunch of you know, incels or whatever. But the reality <laughs> is a lot of the Bitcoiners I know are married men with, with kids. You know, and yeah. that's, just, that's this reality of that's kind of a very common demographic for, for us. Yeah, totally. I, yeah, I think the, the stereotype of like the van dwelling, meat eating Bitcoin incel guy. I mean, I've certainly met him at conferences. He's real. He's real. But uh, he's, he's not as plentiful as the media would like you to imagine or other people on Twitter would like you to imagine. Like most people in Bitcoin are, um, yeah, they're like, I would say that some of the bonds that Bitcoiners share, it's like pronatalism, a respect for beauty and culture a respect of things that are Lindy, so a respect of traditional things, um, conservative value sets, uh, you know, not just not just fiscally, but also in, in many cultural aspects. Um, these are sort of things that bind Bitcoiners together. Now, at the same time, it's interesting because there are Bitcoiners who are, you know, more on the progressive side of things, who I, I think actually share a lot of these same values, right? Like... Um, I would call I would call many of the progressive Bitcoiners like classic liberals um, who fall more into that camp of classic liberalism, which is like sort of mainstream libertarianism. Right. Um, and it's interesting because it's like when it, when you think about culture, it's not just I, you know, I, I shuffle everything through the lens of uh, American culture because I'm a, an American xenophobe. No, I'm kidding. I'm not xenophobic, <laughs> but I am an American. And I view everything through the dogma of American ideology and American culture. Right. It's It's hard for me not to because. This is the only place I've ever lived, and uh, I am uniquely American in that way. Same with, you know, I think it's hard for, you know, like Peter McCormick to, you know, not view things through a uniquely British lens, and that gets him consistently in trouble on Bitcoin Twitter, right? Um, (laughs) Because the Americans fucking hate that. We always do. But when you think about Bitcoin, it's a global – Bitcoin is a global asset. It's global currency. It's a global phenomenon. And I think that every culture that's Lindy – in some respect, is going to be, you know, passed through the prism of Bitcoin. And some of them are going to stick and embrace Bitcoin. Some of them are going to view Bitcoin as, you know, uh, haram, basically. Uh, And it'll be interesting to see which cultures embrace Bitcoin or which cultures um, sort of marry the two things together. Because I don't think it's every culture on earth. And I certainly think that the cultures that don't embrace Bitcoin are likely to be significantly weakened because of that decision. And that's sort of an inevitable decision in some respects. And I'm not smart enough as, as an anthropologist or cultural anthropologist to tell you, like, which cultures are going to dominate and which cultures are not. I'm hoping and I think strongly that American culture is perfect for Bitcoin because I think Bitcoin is sort of a uniquely American idea uh, in that, you know, Bitcoin is foundationally about property rights and america is also foundationally about property rights so i mean i'm with you in terms of the ideals of what america how america started but i do wonder about the typical i'm sure you know where this is going right like a lot of americans particularly young americans have they sort of have this idea of like socialist ideas and maybe for them it doesn't mean that you know the diction okay so the dictionary definition of socialism means you know public ownership of the means of production, right? Many of them are not thinking about it like that. They just think of it like, oh, I just want a big welfare state. I just want, you know, so they look at maybe the, the Scandinavian nations, right? Your Denmarks and Sweden's and so on. And they say, mm-hmm. oh, look how big the welfare state is over there. I want, you know, those kinds of services here. So I'm curious where you see that yeah. uh, blending out, right? Obviously, you started from this idea of, you know, kind of libertarian private property rights. And now it seems to have devolved in yeah. some ways. Where do you think yeah, that yeah. settles out? Well, you know, I mean, obviously a lot of this comes back to fiat and the structure of the money and who has access to the money. You know, what's interesting is that um, with <laughs> with rates rising, I saw a meme the other day that like uh, in, in 2022, when rates, when we had ZERP, um, the, the models on Calvin Klein were out of shape, right? <laughs> yeah. Calvin Klein models yeah. were out of shape. And now in 2023, with high rates, the models are smoking hot tens again, <laughs> right? It's like, yeah, maybe maybe you weren't selling enough jeans with the out of shape models, and you had to go back to what works, right? And so I think that's I think that's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, you know, when I hear people say socialism, I think that many young Americans mean not this, not this 
instantiation of capitalism. We don't we don't know what we want, but we don't want this because this is not working for us. And I do sympathize heavily with that view. Now, if you want to do actual communism, you're my fucking enemy and you should be destroyed because you're trying to destroy other people. Like, truly, you're a bad person. Um, you're, you're the scum of the earth. All communists are the scum of the earth, right? But if you're a misguided young kid who's saying, you know, I'm a, I'm a socialist, and uh, I think what they really mean most of the time is that the system's not working for me. It's not really working for many of the people I know, and I'm looking for something different. And I'm hopeful and positive that over the you know next decade, many of these people are going to find Bitcoin as the thing that is a restorative technology that also allows them to have have dignity, have some level of sovereignty over themselves, um, and you know have a better quality of life because you now have a unit of account in which to save and store value that is increasing over time compared to everything around it, right? And also, when you look at the socialism, modern socialism, that is, you know, uh, the Scandinavian countries, for instance. I mean, it's like Scandinavian countries are homogenous, number one. Number two, they're oil rich, or they were oil rich, some of them. And number three, they have sovereign wealth funds that are invested in the American markets. So American capitalism, or whatever the structure of modern American capitalism is, and you can quibble about the word capitalism, because it is there are there is a lot of, like, corporatism, you know, social corporate welfare, a lot of that kind of stuff. And that's all true, oligopoly. It's still the the engine of American capitalism that is driving the prosperity and the socialism of the Scandinavian countries. Also notable, the Scandinavians invented death metal. So how happy are they, Stefan? They can't be that happy. You know? That's right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, and I also think it's, you know, I agree with you on a lot of points there. I think it's also fair to say some of those Scandinavian countries actually got rich from capitalism and then they sort of became more quote unquote socialist but really they just mean big statism you know um i think also yeah. it's a i think it's a bit xenophobic and uh restrictionist because you can't have socialism and immigration so i think that in some ways it's a protective mechanism to maintain their culture so that if they do socialism they have a a non-racist way to say that uh, people from other cultures are not allowed in right now, that's not something that I necessarily agree with. I'm an American, and I like largely believe in immigration, and I think that we should have you know, a tremendous amount of immigration, especially for intelligent people. But it seems like that's some sort of a protective mechanism that the Scandinavians are using to hold on to their, you know, their culture, their heritage. Right, yeah, and famously, countries like Japan are very you know, uh, insular, and they don't sort of take in new people. And there's, there's very much this culture that even if you go to Japan and you marry a Japanese person, you're still kind of not seen as one of us, let's say. Um, right. But I, another topic I want to get into, and you know, related to what we were saying, right now, politically and philosophically, yeah, I'm a libertarian. I believe in anarcho-capitalism and fully free markets, as as you know, and many listeners know. But at the same time, there are times where we need, let's say, cultural restraints or restrictions on what we do. Right. So you may be a libertarian politically, but that may not necessarily translate exactly. Uh, into how you are in the family. Like maybe in the family you mm. believe that there is a role for, let's say, a beneficial patriarch or maybe there's certain restraints that you should have on you but they're kind of the discipline of the market. Maybe that's one way I would put it. Like we, we need the discipline of the market and maybe that's kind of getting to what you were saying about you know, the Calvin Klein ad that maybe it, the real issue, the Cantillon effect and all these issues are being created by artificially low rates and that is what's creating all this crazy woke behavior and the, all the LGBT stuff and all the other ESG and whatever because it's allowing various parts of the government or various people to live beyond what they really live beyond their means and live mm. without those constraints that we actually need. We actually, in some kind of counterintuitive way, we need these constraints because that's actually what civilizes us. Yeah, I think also that... Um this goes back to living for other people and not living for yourself, right? It's important to be a valued member of, you know, your social web and your community right. and, you know, your and your family. And I think that um, the, the sort of the race war, the cultural war are, are substitutions for a class war that was starting to pick up steam in 2008 when the financial crisis hit. Um, Occupy Wall Street obviously was, you know, sort of a weird movement full of dirty hippies. But at the same time, they were more over the target than I think they realized. And 
ever since Occupy Wall Street, you see, you know, to, in in 2008, it was the same year that Tropic Thunder came out, which was a movie where Robert Downey Jr. was, you know, playing blackface. And everybody in America thought that was the funniest fucking movie of the year. The yeah. theater was packed. It was it was multiracial. It was multicultural. Everybody thought it was funny. And then, you know, suddenly these sort of PSYOP campaigns started in order to get Americans focused on hating each other over inborn, you know, characteristics like skin color rather than focused on the unfairness of the financial and political system because they're intertwined with each other. And uh, it was largely very effective. So kudos to whoever's idea it was to start pushing that because <laughs> you did a good job, man. I mean, Jesus Christ, it's wasted a lot of my time in my life. Yeah. And when it comes to, you know, these scams, right, we've lived through this, you know, fake scam uh, for the last few years. And I guess I'm a little concerned, like, are there more scams to come, right? Is it the climate scam? Is it the you know, is it another pandemic scam? Like, what's you know, what are some of the scams that we should be worried about uh, that that could be coming in the years in, in years to come? Yeah, uh, I'll throw out a conspiracy theory just for fun on the podcast. One thing I am worried about is there's been a lot of telegraphing of a cyber pandemic, and something that is mildly concerning to me is that Bitcoin could get wrapped up in the cyber pandemic story. Now, whether the cyber pandemic is a real phenomenon that could happen or whether it's a false flag operation, impossible to know, probably will be impossible to know even after the fact. Um, but looking forward, you could imagine somebody that was hostile towards Bitcoin making it a central or key part of the story, like a ransomware attack that involved Bitcoin that took down, you know, some crucial infrastructure and that crucial infrastructure being out ended up, you know, resulting in the death of some number of Americans, right? Like a, a hospital system or something, you know, people in the ICU, their vents shut off, et cetera. These things can happen. And, you know, the digital world is increasingly, the digital world is being grafted onto the physical world and it's making things increasingly fragile. So like where I am, um, there was a attack on uh, the MGM Grand uh, Resorts and Properties just recently that's being sort of underreported. But here in town, it's been sort of widely reported, which is that um, the hackers just got into almost everything. I mean, they, they were able to attack the slot machines. They were able to attack the front desk systems. And this is costing this corporation untold amounts of money. And, and you don't – the scary thing about cyber stuff is like you don't really know if it's a state actor. You don't really know if it's a individual group. You don't know where they are in the world, if they have protection from a government that's hostile towards your government, in which case there's going to be almost no reprisals against them. And I think in the case of the MGM hack, these people were in uh, Russia. And so obviously Russia and America are not on good terms at the moment. So Russian law enforcement is not going to lift a finger to help an American corporation that suffered an attack, even if it's at the request uh, of a high level you know, American law enforcement agency. So we're going to move into this world of, I think, you know, there's going to have to be an event that causes people to, like, wise up about security practices and things online. I think, like, AI hacking tools are kind of terrifying when you look into them, like the speed and the capability at which people will be able to be socially engineered. Uh, it's it's kind of frightening. And one thing that I'm hopeful on is that we as Bitcoiners have been, like, living in this, you know, test environment for the last decade where we've been subjecting ourselves to all manner of, you know, cyber, cyber stuff. And... Uh, We've gotten good at, you know, first of all, we have a pristine elliptic curve that we can use, right? Like that's that's good to know that Bitcoin's elliptic curve is not subject to a trillion dollar hack. That's really good to know. And so if you're building a technology that's, you know, going to be cryptographically secure, like why not use Bitcoin's elliptic curve? Like that's that's probably like the smartest thing that you could do. Um, and then you get into the whole like quantum and this and that. I'm not going to go down that whole rabbit hole. But like yeah, I do yeah. think that we're going to live in a world – I think we're sort of the canaries in the coal mine as Bitcoiners – and we're going to live in a world in which the regular person is carrying around the equivalent of a YubiKey or a hardware wallet or a physical password manager. And they're using them to sign in to you know, all their different devices and services and interact with everybody in their life who's a real human being. Because it's going to be really easy. You know, It is really easy now. These tools just aren't widespread to fake Stefan Lavera's voice and make it seem like you know, you're, you're telling me, hey, Otto, I need money. Send me money. I've been kidnapped. Help me, help me, help me, right? And I'm gonna be like, uh, "Hey, Stefan, I need your, I need your key, my guy. I need, your, I need your cryptographic signature because if not, I'm not helping you. Sorry, like it is what it is, you know." Yeah, I think, uh, the, and you've you've spoken about this as well about the identity 
the market for identity and products around this. Um, I think it's interesting. There's this idea that, okay, once enough people get burnt or wrecked, that they're going to take it more seriously. But at the same time, as I'm sure you know, there was this big Equifax hack where like almost every American got you know wrecked or doxxed in some way. And, you know, it seems that there's kind of just constant um, attacks like this that are happening. And yet, I guess it's just difficult to remain private in the world today because of how many things that require doxing, right? If you want to fly, you need a passport. If you want to drive, you need a driver's license. If you're having kids, guess what? You need to get birth certificates for them unless you want them to be fully like non-KYC kids, undocumented, you know what I mean? So it's just kind of like, it's just how do you manage all of these things together in a world where there's so much manual um what kind of digital things are realistic? Because at the same time, of course, you know, there's the grandma argument of, you know, grandma doesn't know how to use a YubiKey um, and people just like not being tech savvy enough. What gets them to take it seriously? Yeah, I mean, obviously a large scale cyber event would get them to take it seriously. I mean, the thing that has got gotten us to take it seriously is uh, having our having our wealth, you know, having to secure our wealth. That's a very serious uh, thing. I think having to secure your you know, digital identity against uh, fraud of various types is going to be, you know, something that people are going to want. Um, when it comes to the identity thing, you know, I've been paying attention to the calls for, there's this sort of want or desire for a driver's license for the internet. Um, certain elite boomers in America are certainly pushing this and globally. I think Europe is well ahead on this and, you know, Europe had more success with the, uh, the vaccine passports and that kind of thing. America defeated the vaccine passport um, this time around, but that's not you know that's not how they're going to do things in America. In America, we're going to get backdoored, you know, some one way, shape, or form because Americans are fat and lazy and we love convenience, and so it's like whatever is convenient and easy. And you know, I mean, how much privacy am I doxing just by uh, owning a suite of Apple products? Probably a shitload, you know. <laughs> Probably just everything. I, there's a, you know, you have a Alexa or a smart TV in your home. It's listening to you. I mean, that's how you do things in America. But, like, you won't be able to codify it the, will you, the way you will be able to in Europe, where in Europe um, and in Australia and in some of the places that were more, you know, authoritarian. Did you did you see recently Sean Strickland versus Israel Adesanya? In, I heard about uh, this, yeah. In Australia. It was, a, so, it was an upset fight. Yeah, go on. It was an upset fight, but... What was more interesting was Strickland, uh, sort of an American right winger, um, he was going at the press and saying, your country's garbage, you arrested a pregnant lady for posting on Facebook, <laughs> fuck you guys, right? And oh, the, press awesome. was, the, the press was like bemused, like they were like, what are you talking about? We don't, we've never heard of this event, right? It's like, what do you mean you've never heard of this? This was worldwide global news. Like we all now know, I used to think of Australia as like a place where people threw shrimps on the Barbies and chased kangaroos around or something. And now I think of Australia as a authoritarian police state. And I'm never going to get that out of my head because during COVID, it became an authoritarian police state, right? And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, you basically lived through it. And uh, I'd yeah, love to I mean, that's why it's a big part it. of why I left. I mean, I'm in yeah. Dubai now. And yeah, absolutely. I think I'd... Coming back to that point you mentioned earlier about betrayal, right? To me, it was just a massive betrayal, right? As like you and probably most people thought, you know, we're freer than those other countries, right? And think about Canada, New Zealand, Australia, particularly were bad on the COVID authoritarian uh, front. And all of us in these countries would have thought, oh, we're better than those other countries. Okay, yeah, maybe our taxes are higher, but we're still free. But the reality is... You know, none of us are really truly free. And so, yeah, it just felt like a massive betrayal to me. And, you know, I'm still just surprised at how many Australians don't see that and understand that. You know, to them, it's like an alien concept. So, yeah. You know. One of the things that's amazing is when the, you know, when, when the state, especially like your your relationship with the state is is important, I think. And it's important that people think about their relationship with the state. And, you know, <laughs> it's like, you used I used to feel like I was um you know abiding by the rules and regulations of my country because this is what we do and we're good citizens and you know you pay your taxes because they're going into social services and they're they're helping people. I used to really genuinely think this. And uh now I think to myself, the reason you pay your taxes is so somebody doesn't show up at your door and murder you, right? <laughs> I mean, 
That's how yeah. I think. And maybe that's just, you know, us libertarians are crazy and we can't help but see the entire world through the monopoly of violence filter and everything comes down to the non-aggression principle. Maybe that's the case, right? And regular people don't think about this, but that is the reality. And when you have a relationship with the state, as, as everybody does, even in Dubai, you have a relationship with the state. Um, the state holds a gun to your head in every interaction you have with it. And when somebody has a gun to your head, you know, you really listen to what they have to say. It's really interesting what they have to say, right? You could be saying the dumbest bullshit ever, but if you have a gun to my head, I'm very interested in what you have to say, <laughs> what you have to say. <laughs> and so I think it's important to like listen closely. Some jurisdictions are going to be better than others. And, you know, there's going to be, um, I think, I think the jurisdictions that are going to do well are going to be the jurisdictions that have, that prioritize human, uh, individual freedom and sovereignty, right? And respect the rights of encryption powered individuals and respect people who are, you know, uh, taking a toehold in this new digital world in a way that's uh, self sufficient, sovereign, and free. And that doesn't mean that those people are not, you know, subject to the rules and regulations of whatever jurisdiction they happen to find themselves in, because obviously they are because of the gun that's pointed at everybody's head. Um, but I do think that, you know, you're going to drive capital away from your country if you are not respecting uh, the property rights and the freedom of, you know, the individuals within your country. And that was the thing that made America a great place is we respected capital. We really respected capital. Everything else was secondary to that primary respect of capital. And the places that are going to be great uh, over the next hundred years are going to be places that respect capital. And I hope strongly that America's on the list. And I think we as American Bitcoiners, you know, not yourself, Stefan, but the people I'm talking to in the audience, yeah. it, it's on us to make sure that that is the case and that America doesn't stray too far from its foundational principles, you know. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, ultimately, we are going to see more and more competition as well. So I think more and more people will look at other countries around the world and they'll yeah. say, well, hey, you know, why be here if you're paying all this high tax there or it's high cost of living there? I could go somewhere else. You know, I think that, you know, yes, there are certain hurdles and things that come, you know, with that. But if you really compound it, and here's an interesting stat, uh, as you might know from the sovereign individual, there's a really interesting stat. So basically they say, if you could earn, if you could make a tax saving of five thousand dollars per year, and you could invest it at ten percent per year over right. a period of forty years, do you know what that number is? It's two point um, two million dollars. Yep. Right. And for some people, they could save a lot more than just five thousand dollars. Right. If you could save fifty thousand dollars, well, now it's twenty-two million dollars at the end of your life. And so, you know, whether that's for you or for you know your children, you're passing down that wealth. You know, I think that will start to weigh on more people's minds. And so this kind of idea of it's going to get really competitive where you go and where you actually live. And yeah. I think some countries will just sort of treat it like, oh, we can rest on our laurels and we don't need to be competitive. And then on the other hand, you have other places that are trying to be competitive, whether that's El Salvador or who knows if uh, Javier Millier gets into Argentina and mm. you know, turns it good there. Um, the Argentina you know, we'll story is really interesting because until uh – Javier Mille's candidacy, I wasn't paying much attention to Argentina. I knew that uh, Wences, uh, Cesares, you know, famous yeah. Bitcoin, famous Bitcoiner, was uh, was from Argentina originally, and that had shaped his early understanding of Bitcoin. And I know, actually, there are um, a numerous Bitcoiners I've met over the years who are Argentinians, and Argentinians just get it like like that instantly, right? So I think his, his uh, presidency and his campaign is very interesting. He's not president yet, but, you know, I was looking into the history of... Um, the history of, you know, Buenos Aires and uh, Buenos Aires is a fucking amazing city, you know, that was really respectful of capital and people were coming there and it was considered like the Paris of, of Latin America. And then they embrace socialism. And the minute you embrace socialism, you're just stuck in this permanent downward spiral where, you know, you're being led by this, um, you know, sort of culture of envy and, uh, you know, equality, right? Where it's the type of quality where, you know, if uh, if your dick is seven inches and, and minus three, then we got to cut four inches off your dick, Stefan. I'm sorry. Like, it is it is what it is. You know, we got to be equal, man. Um, that's that's a brutalist, you know, anti-human philosophy. And only monsters believe in that. Like, only terrible, awful, horrific scumbag people believe in that ideology. And, you know, if you do believe in it, fuck you in the strongest possible terms. Like, just fuck you. Uh, I, I can't make it any clearer than that, you know. It, yeah, it's it's interesting though. Like, um, 
hopeful, I'm very hopeful that the experiments that are going on in El Salvador, potentially there's a new experiment going on in Argentina. I know about other experiments that are happening, like, you know, potentially in the Caribbean. And I think we're going to see more announcements about nation states in the coming years. You know, in Latin, in uh, Latin America, especially in the Caribbean, um, I think El Salvador was a real, you know, sort of a guidebook for, you know, it was a framework for how to do this for people. And there are many people in many different governments thinking about how they can do this. But the problem that many of the people in many of the different governments have is they think about what Bitcoin can do for them. And really what the framework that you need to create is what can you do for Bitcoiners? What can you do for the people who have the capital? Because you want to bring the capital to your shores. So you need to be in a more of a giving relationship than a taking relationship because you're not in any position to take. If you if you look at like the places that take the most, you know, like uh, in America, California. California is a gorgeous – it's beautiful. I mean Malibu is fantastic. Like everybody that lives there is beautiful. The infrastructure is uh, – the infrastructure is piss poor. But like you got the beach, right? And so they can be a bit abusive to you because, <laughs> because they have this amazing beach and coastline. Whereas – Texas is sort of a shrubby mess of, you know, just uh, tumbleweeds and, and <laughs> scorpions and deserts. And so it's like you can't be as abusive if you're the, the Texas, uh, you know, if you're the you, if you're the regulators in Texas. I think um, one thing that's interesting, at, you know, from an American framework, we always think about just the ability to move states, hop states. And I think that's a unique thing for Americans. So we're not stuck in, like, say, France. We can just go to Texas. And Texas and California are, are culturally like pretty disparate, and their politics are extremely disparate. And uh, you know, Florida, Wyoming, it's all the places that are embracing Bitcoin in America, I think, are going to do extraordinarily well. And all of the places that are embracing socialism in America are, are going to do worse and worse and worse. If you look at um, California, the California population grew every single year from when they started keeping statistics in the late 1800s. Until Gavin Newsom's governorship, Damn. in which the population began to decline. So if you're the guy who the population declined on for the first time ever, maybe you should take a good, long, hard look in the mirror about uh, your ability to govern because it's not that great, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, so there'll be competitive, you know, states inside the U.S. There'll be competitive countries all around the world. Um, Another interesting question that I think, some people raise this idea of, oh, is Bitcoin for everyone or is it for anyone? Uh, you know, what kind of relative levels should mm-hmm. you be targeting, right? Because some people have this view of, oh, the remnant and other people have the view of, no, just like get as many people on board. Um, yeah. My view is, yeah, I guess my view is more like, look, we've just lived through, you know, a few years of craziness. I think clearly 80% of people are just, you know, Sadly, a lot of them are just going to go with the narrative, right? As much as whatever the new narrative is, they'll just go with that and it's going to be difficult um, to sort of get them on board. But I think maybe that 10 to 20% or so, these are the people that we can reach. And yeah. currently today, in terms of Bitcoin adoption, we're probably under 1%. So there's, you know, in that sense, that's kind of where I'm sort of targeting efforts, I think. Um, yeah. Whoever I think is open-minded, I'm going to try to go to them and try to obviously get them to learn about Bitcoin. Um, but where do, you, where do you see that? Do you agree, disagree? Where yeah. are you at? So one thing that frustrates me uh, is when I hear Bitcoiners have this conversation about why are there not more people using Bitcoin as a medium of exchange? It's like that has such an obvious answer that I'm not sure even why you're asking the question. The reason why there are not more Americans and Europeans using Bitcoin as a medium of exchange is because of tax treatment. It, that's the only reason, Right. I mean, I'm an American who saves a lot of my uh, wealth in Bitcoin, and I would, you know, like to just be able to spend it freely, but I, it creates a taxable burden every time I do so. So I'm much more likely to spend in dollars than I am to spend in Bitcoin. That's the reality of the situation, right? So if you're going to be building um, an app that's, you know, focused on like, you know, merchant, pay- merchant payments and like, you know, consumer adoption, you're going to be looking in the third world mainly. You're going to be looking in Africa and Latin America. Uh, primarily maybe India. Um, th- those are the places where you need to be building for. But yet, for some reason, many American Bitcoiners seem to not understand this phenomenon and they don't like, they, they think that it's a technical failure of Bitcoin, like something wrong is wrong with the Lightning Network and therefore that's why we don't have enough people using it. It's like the demand is not there because of the tax treatment. Nobody wants to have to deal with a taxable event every time they buy a sandwich at the supermarket. Like that's just not how things work, right? So I think that, in America and in richer and more developed nations in general, 
you know, Bitcoin, we have to always remember that Bitcoin is a capital system. And so, you know, capitalists who have a lot of fiat wealth are going to bring the most value to Bitcoin, right? So it's, it's not like you getting your grandma to stacking sat, to stack sats is good for the uh, health of the Bitcoin network, right? It's good for your grandma. It's good for the people that you orange pill along the way, but it's not good for like Bitcoin, Bitcoin's network effect. The thing that's good for Bitcoin's network effect is rich people allocating. That's why Michael Saylor is important. That's why the next, you know, 10 billionaires are important. Eventually, it, it even leads all the way up to central banks allocating, which there's nothing that anybody can do to prevent that from happening. And that will occur. Central banks are sort of like the last big allocators of Bitcoin, and they will allocate. Sometimes I talk to Bitcoiners who think that's not going to happen. It is going to happen because uh, they have to, you know, for self-preservation to prevent speculative attack. They literally have to. The game theory uh, is such that if you don't put Bitcoin on your balance sheet, you're you're going to get eaten by Bitcoin, right? So you have to put some you have to put up a defensive front. Do you, do you want to right? spell that out a little bit for people who aren't familiar? Like, why would they have to? Yeah. So basically, <laughs> you called me out on this. I'm not I'm not as good an economist as uh, yourself or Pierre. So I'm I'm going to ask you to spell. <laughs> you spell so, it out. Okay. Know. If I had, to, I mean, okay. So I mean, you could you could make an argument that okay, a lot of them hold gold. Right. Why do they hold still hold gold? Um, you know, there could be an argument made around that. There's an but argument I'm, even I, that we're on a shadow gold standard because all the world governments still have a tremendous clutch of gold. Yeah, you know? it could be. But I mean, at the end of the day, we are, you know, still live, as you know, as listeners know, we're still living in a fully fiat world. And, yep. you know, if you look at, let's say, Matthew Bajinskis' work, um, you know, over at Porkopolis, and if you look at, let's say, the base money rate growth, right? Just looking at America from 1969 to like, I think... The stat, his stat goes from last year, it's like 9% per year. So if you haven't been making more than 9% per year, you're losing. Right. You're literally losing pace in real terms. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's possible that um, there'll be central banks who try to buy Bitcoin. Um, and, I mean, of course, there are some already, like I'm sure El Salvador's buying some. Publicly, they're my, buying some. My, reason, you know? my reasoning for saying this originally is because I've been imagining a scenario for a while now where uh, a rich Bitcoiner who's like a Soros type attempts to break one of the central banks using Bitcoin. And if you don't have enough Bitcoin reserves, uh, you can't dump them at market in order to stem the attack or prevent the attack, right? And so I think that's one of the reasons, game theoretically, why a central bank would want to have Bitcoin reserves. Back to the show in a moment. Mempool.space is the leading Bitcoin and blockchain visualizer. Bitcoin is a multi-layer ecosystem and Mempool.space helps you explore that ecosystem. It's really useful if you are looking to target the fee for your transaction, whether you're looking at medium or high priority fees, you want to look at the Mempool, you want to look at the blockchain, you want to look at the history of transactions and search transactions and see even which transactions relate to Lightning channel opens or closes. They also show you second layer networks like the Lightning network. And with mempool.space, you don't even have to trust a third party. You can host and run it yourself. It's free and open source software. Keep an eye out on the website. They are continually rolling out new features and you can find more information over at mempool.space. And now back to the show. I think that would make sense in a context where their fiat was perhaps backed by bitcoin and what i mean by backed by is yeah. redeemable for right and i think historically in you know in the gold standard days and the bimetallism days they the gold standard at least in those you know imperfect as it was the gold standard acted as a little bit of a check on government expansionary behavior because right. if they did gold would flow out of the country to other countries. And so that central bank would sort of lose some of its, you know, his poker chips at the table, right? He's losing. So for that reason, it acted as a discipline. Like I was saying, it's kind of, it was kind of like a beneficial discipline. Then, of course, as, you know, every Bitcoiner knows, every good Bitcoiner knows, 1971, they took away the tether, at least in the US. And then we were fully free-floating fiat from that point on. Yeah. And so... I you touched yeah. on something important, which is that uh, this is part of my framework is that, you know, I, I believe we're likely to see uh, nation states back their central bank digital currencies via Bitcoin. The same way that Terra Luna attempted to back its uh, currency via Bitcoin, I think that nation states are going to do it, but they're going to do it a lot more effectively than, than Terra Luna. And that's one yeah. of the ways that they're going to that's one of the ways they're going to maintain power. You know, so they'll, yeah, I mean, that... they'll likely use a basket of fiat currencies. Yes. I don't know if they would, um, maybe they would it's include gold in there. Right. Yeah. It's not going to happen right away in one fell swoop. 
Yeah. Um, it's, you know, Bitcoin will become a small portion of the basket and then over time it'll grow because Bitcoin grows, right? And then eventually yeah. you're going to move into this world in which, you know, it's, I, I think about it similar to, maybe I'm getting too big and uh, sweeping here, but I think about it sort of like the Roman Empire's embrace of Christianity, which is like, in the beginning, the Roman Empire killed Christ, um, and then later they had to accept his teachings and his doctrine in order to maintain power, right? Right. And so then they became the Holy Roman Empire, and they, they became, you know, it sort of collapsed all the functions, the church, the the emperor, the state all became one thing, and they used it to maintain power. And I think that uh, you're likely to see it because you have to let's like go a little far out here. Bitcoin at 10, 100 million dollars a coin. That's a different world than the world we live in today. It's a very different world. And Bitcoin is a really large like financial behemoth on the world stage. And its gravity and its weight is, you know, affecting things much more strongly than these things in absentia. So right now, the reason that you're able to play some of these fiat power games is because you don't have some large monetary black hole out there sucking up your energy. Although Bitcoiners like ourselves, we think that that black hole is here and it's right on the we're right on the event horizon of like this thing tipping over to sucking in the entire world, right? That's that's yeah. like sort of our belief structure. Yeah, I mean, not this cycle, but maybe a few more cycles and yeah, maybe <laughs> yeah. it gets to that point, right? Yeah. I would like it if it was this cycle, but you know, <laughs> it's not, probably not this cycle. But um, yeah, I, I think that when you have this sort of giant, you know, gorilla in the world of uh, financial assets, that it changes the calculus for what you're able to do and not able to do. You can't You can't run negative rates in a world where like, Let's say let's say seventy percent of the American population holds Bitcoin. You can't run negative rates on them. You know, you can try your best, but it's not going to work. Yeah, and I think yeah. So it, that really, to me, it shows the importance of the bottom up adoption. But like you said, you know, for every Michael Saylor or micro strategy or big company or even you know insurance firms, yeah. you know, advisor firms, like you know, there's there's pool, big pools of wealth out there, maybe even excluding the central banks, just big pools of wealth out there. You know, businesses could stack on their balance sheet. Insurance firms might need to hold some Bitcoin. Uh, yeah. Pension funds might need to hold some Bitcoin. Like all of the, once you add all of these things up and of course the ETF stuff, um, you know, that'll drive a lot of people in too. And I think that is what's going to change it. And so to your point about when the price of Bitcoin yeah. is much, much higher, I think large holders of Bitcoin will have a lot more political sway in how things happen because they'll say, hey, if you want me to invest in your country, you know, I want this or I want this low tax yeah. or this low regulation or whatever. So yeah, yeah. it might be, maybe that's one angle that, you know, a few cycles from now, uh, it could go. By the, by the way, just to be, you know, I, I want to make sure that like, I do think, I do believe strongly that Bitcoin is is for everybody. I just think that uh, the average American is is so uninterested, at least at this point. And right. yeah. uh, attempting to talk to a person who's largely uninterested is pretty much just not an effective strategy. You know, I mean, uh, nobody had to orange pill you. You orange pilled yourself. I orange pilled myself. You know, we, we're just that's how it works. Right. And yeah, we're on the vanguard of this thing because we're, you know, crazy libertarians or whatever. But, uh, you know, it's only... I, I over the years I've I've noticed more and more normal people. You know, there's plenty of people who have no idea what the non-aggression principle is, or who've never read about Milton Friedman's pencil, who uh, you know own Bitcoin, right? And that's a good thing. That's a positive thing. Can't just have it be all crazy libertarians eating only meat. <laughs> Yeah. Look, I think I think part of it is that look, a lot of people, and this is where maybe some of the memes came from, right? Um, you know, and you know, you're right to criticize as well. At the same time, people being overconfident and so on. But I think some yeah. of those, you know, the three word memes, they came from this idea that look, most people are not going to go read the 1,000 page textbook totally. or Human Action 100%. and so on. And so most people will just adopt some of these ideals, just like an osmosis thing because that's just the society you live in that you respect other people's property rights like you don't even think too hard about that right now yeah. most people and to be fair most people do do that it's just that they make an exception a special little exemption in their mind for the government they say oh the government is allowed to do x y and z right right you know, conscription for warfare is okay but if i were to manual if you were to manually enslave me that would be obviously wrong and to send me off to war in your war well no but when the government does it oh okay now it's okay right so that i <laughs> well, think that aspect is going to change by the way just um 
you know, I'm on the overconfidence point, I'm, I'm not just criticizing everybody else. I'm criticizing myself mainly because I was the most overconfident. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I was like insanely overconfident. And I, I do think that there's, um, definitely something very useful to the distillation of memes because they spread Bitcoin's idea and it gets people talking. So like, if you hate the meme, Bitcoin fixes this. Well, then, like you've fallen perfectly into Michael's trap when he created the meme, because that's now now you're talking about Bitcoin and why it does or does not fix things, right? So it's like it doesn't have to do the perfect. It's like this. It's like um, you can't tell people how to think, but if you're good at meme craft, you can tell people what to think about, right? So like certainly none of us uh, focused much on most of the cultural. Uh, topics over the last 10 years, but we've all been sort of heavily psyoped into thinking about them quite a bit, right? And like, we make up our own minds, oh, I'm on this side, or I'm on that side. But it's like, the truth is, the person that's, you know, actually the most effective at the propaganda is the person that is telling you what the subject is, not how you think about the subject, but what the subject is. And so like, in that way, I think the Bitcoin memes have been very effective. Um, But also, you know, there, here's something is, there's a danger to, (laughs) this is going to sound maybe controversial, but there's a danger to orange pilling people before they're ready, you know? Right. So, it's like the Matrix unplugging them before they're ready thing. 100%. And I've had this with friends who, uh, you know, I've had friends who got into Bitcoin, were stacking sats, were doing all the right things. Uh, and then at some point, the greed got the better of them. And they went on Nexo. And they took a loan. And they thought to themselves, Bitcoin will never go below this price. And then it did. And they ended up losing all of their Bitcoin, you know, and it took them to a deep, dark place because they had gone from this feeling of uh, in financial empowerment and sovereignty to a feeling of despair. And I look back on some of those friends I had that went down that path and I think to myself, maybe this is your fault. Maybe like talking about myself, like maybe I orange pilled them when they weren't ready and they should have waited longer in their journey. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean. Forcing Bitcoin on normal people is really not the answer. Bitcoin is going to meet the need of the people that it meets the need of where it meets the need of those people. And like when you talk about medium of exchange, that's in that's in the developing world. And when you talk about, you know, uh, savings devaluation technology, that's that's in the developed world because people in the developing world don't have anything to save. So why the fuck would they need to hold Bitcoin for a long time? Like they don't. They, they need shit day to day. Because their lives are, are tough and they're trying to hustle, you know, some amount of bananas into, you know, a meal for their family that night, right? Um, whereas me and you are thinking we're a little bit more at the top of Maslow's hierarchy and we're thinking a little bit more long term. So, yeah, I think Bitcoin's going to meet the need of whoever, you know, whatever, whoever needs it at that time. And that when you try and force things before their time, you actually end up causing distortions. And again, I'm talking about myself and being self-critical here because – I think I've done that to people, and I think it hasn't always worked out effectively. Yeah, look, I, I would say in to, in your defense, let me say, you can't know in advance. True. Because, you know, it's kind of like sometimes, you know that saying like sometimes money changes people. Well, maybe they were yeah. always that way, and it kind of revealed what they really were, you know. And I think to some extent, yes, you know, you want to be – encourage people to be prudent, right, like to not – lever over their heads to be intelligent and stay solvent. I think that's an important thing. But it is also difficult in today's world when so many people are in debt, as you mentioned, right? So many people in the middle class are just living on credit, living on debt. They've got their credit card. They want their credit card points or they want you know loans for this and loans for that. It's just genuinely a hard um, slog out there. So I guess you know, yeah. focusing on the people who can save and focusing on you know the people who are open-minded, I think that's, that's probably where I'm seeing it. That's the pathway forward. Um, totally. So, I, I think that, you yeah. know, just in general, like, um, the best way to do things is to let people know that you are the Bitcoin guy. They already know that anyway, because, you know, you're, you're not going to yeah. shut the fuck up about it. None of us do. And uh, to just, you know, that if they have questions or whatever, they can come to you anytime and you're happy to help them, but not to force things on, on them. Right. Right. And, um, yeah, I, th- I think that that's just been, you know... Because if you believe like we believe in Bitcoin and you're as convicted as we are, it's kind of hard not to tell people because you're just so damn sure of what's happening here. And you know that most people don't see it. And it feels almost like 
morally uh, irresponsible not to tell people, right? Yeah, of course. But I then, mean, it's like we have this life raft and we want our friends to get on the yeah. life raft instead of sinking. <laughs> but yeah. then you, you actually may be doing an ineffective service by, you know, being so zealous about the whole affair, right? Like that, that might be the problem. Uh, I think quiet confidence wins the day nine times out of ten. And so for me, I listen, I probably did this for like seven years. I was just going around being like, you know, you got to get Bitcoin. <laughs> and then over time, I was just like, what am I doing? I, I'm being so annoying. <laughs> you know? Well, I think, we, you know, we all have uh, reflections and we're all, you know, you and I are going on our hodler journey, you know, even now today, uh, yeah. like, you, like even this deep in. So. I think the yeah I think but I think you're right the the lesson is um focusing on the quiet confidence and uh you know being available to help people when they need help but not sort of okay. ramming it down their throat uh and sort of it's like that saying uh, when the student is ready the teacher appears right it's it's sort yeah. of you have to sort of wait for that moment and that's why for me it's sort of you need ideally an ongoing relationship with that person uh so that you can sort of coach them and say okay so you bought some coins have you got a you know, a Bitcoin wallet. Have you got a hardware wallet? Have you got a Bitcoin node? Yeah. And sort of sl- slowly step them up when they're ready, of course. Um, and of course, you know, the the tech and the UX will make it easier and easier, you know, but that's that's sort of the high level of how I'm seeing it. Um, yeah. So yeah, let's, let's like, finish up here. Oh, go on. Yep. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just saying, well, let's finish up here. I guess, uh, I think some of it, like obviously we're talking at this time now, it, it's a reflection of where we are in the cycle, right? If we were talking in, you know, yeah. March yeah. 2021, it'd be like, oh, Bitcoin is going to take over the world and there's going to be all these, you know, like, so you know, I'm sure when we speak again in like, you know, if we talk again in a year or two, it might be totally different. Should we do some, uh, just to, just for fun, should we do like a wild bullish prediction? Just oh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, do you have any? I don't know. Uh, you mean like right, yeah, price or like one, what happens? You got to get okay. one too. You got to get yeah, one too. I will, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, I'm going to say... Okay, my prediction from last cycle was 300k, <laughs> so I'm sticking with it. I'm going 300 300k sometime in late 25 seems to be where things are gonna are gonna head for me. And I think I do think like just looking forward, I think we're probably gonna trend upwards towards um, you know the having. I I wouldn't discount the idea of a potential you know precipitous fall the same way we had one in. March 12, 2020. So don't lever up. By the way, this is important. I had friends who levered up uh, and got totally hosed in March of 2020. And these guys are, you know, Bitcoiners who should know better. So don't be that guy. Uh, just hodl your coins. Don't take leverage. If you're going to take leverage, do it much later in the cycle and with a lot less leverage than you think you should need, right? And yeah, I think we're going to trend up towards the having, and then after the having, I think same old story. And people say, is the having is the having doing things? Is it not? Is it effective? Does it, you know, whatever, is it ineffective? I think that the psychological phenomenon of the having is reflexive in nature. And because the people believe the having, it basically tells the story of Bitcoin scarcity to the 90% of the market who don't believe it, right? And so people who are hearing about the having are, are literally hearing about Bitcoin scarcity for the first time. And that's a powerful story. The having itself eh, could mean something, could not. But Bitcoin scarcity means a lot so after that we're going to trend up to 300k that's my prediction yeah okay interesting um look i i so okay obvious disclaimers here not financial yeah. advice etc don't hold me to this but if i had to guess i honestly i actually think this cycle could be so okay he, people have this idea that you know oh the cycles are diminishing over time but maybe just the last cycle was kind of outlier maybe next cycle actually is a bigger cycle than that like i think it's actually possible that it, we really do go to like something close to gold, right? If we, if Bitcoin's market went to the size yeah. of gold, it might be something like half a mil, something yeah. in that range. Maybe half a mil, maybe 600,000. Like 11, 10, 11, 12 trillion market, somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And Bitcoin today is what, 500 billion something? So, you know, 100%. it's not that, you know, to me, it's not that crazy. But I'm also not a trader. I'm a stacker, right? So I'm kind of, you know, and, I, and here's the thing. It could go that high, but we might still get a big 80% drop at the end of it, you know? So yeah. I, I would not... Um, you know, if you take, if you, you know, uh, like generally just avoid leverage or if you are doing it, it needs to be like, you're a professional, like you're doing a very small percentage of your stack. You have income, you have kind of contingency plans. Like it's not just kind of like, don't be a DJ and like lever up <laughs> and, you know, don't, don't do yeah. DJ leverage. But of course, 
you know, maybe for some people it, it couldn't kind of make sense. But honestly, for most people, just avoid leverage and just, you know, just stack. And I think that is going to be the pathway for most people. Um, but, you know, also, I would encourage people to actually look at other jurisdictions, you know, like I think mm. it's, it's time for people to do that because here's the thing. It'll make it more competitive. And I think over the years to come, we'll see more people actually try to do that because look at the other trends that are coming, right? We've got more digital work and remote work stuff happening. You know, right. th- there's all this kind of automation and, you know, AI or whatever, chatbots and whatever. I think that is going to cause these big shifts and you have to adapt. We have to continue to innovate or you get, you know, you get uh, like uh, you get wrecked or your business model goes down. So you, you sort of have to continue innovating. So I guess uh, I do predict also that, you know, in this in the next bull cycle, whenever it happens, that we'll see more countries, big companies, big investment firms come out and say, hey, we're doing Bitcoin. Obviously, like the spot ETF yeah. and stuff is going to drive Black a lot rock, of that. Fidelity, et cetera, yeah. yeah. So I think those will be some high level stuff. But I think human nature and greed will kind of come in again. There'll be people who overlever at the top. Mm. There'll be people who kind of chase for yield. There'll be, you know, maybe there'll be some more like cloud mining stuff or cloud mining scam or something like that. You know, we don't know exactly, but I think it's like uh, that idea that it kind of rhymes with past cycles that, you know, things that we saw in yeah. prior cycles, we'll see them come around again. So I guess that's kind of high level. But yeah, I guess if I had to put a number, if I believe what could be like the top of the next cycle, maybe 500, maybe 500K, but nice. I'm, I like I'm expecting a big drop after that as well. So, and I wouldn't try to, and importantly, I'm not trying to trade it. Right. So yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I, I, I have hodled, I have hodled down twice now from the top and uh let me tell you it sucks <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but here's but the thing you don't trying, know it's the top at the time away, yeah yeah i'm not trying to trade away my stack so I'd, I'd rather just deal with the bad feelings than uh end up with less bitcoin you know yeah so i you know i, I think um that's probably a good spot to finish up so i guess i don't know if you have any uh any last things you want to say uh and let's leave it there until uh until next time no i'm good man thanks for having me on brother it was Thank good to you. See you again. And it's great to see you and I hope to uh, catch up again soon. Are you going to Pacific Bitcoin? You're going to be there, right? No, I have a I have a oh, newborn, damn. so it's going to be oh, too yes. hard. Okay. But, yeah, yeah, but I'll I'll probably be in uh Nashville. Okay. You're going to be in Nashville. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, I should be there. So yeah. Awesome, okay, man. Cool. Well, thank you and I'll see you soon. All right, brother. So, what do you think? Are you hodling through the cycle? Let me know what you think. And of course, if you enjoyed the show, make sure to share it there with your friends and get the show notes at stefanlevera.com. Thanks and I'll see you in the Citadels.